Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the 40th episode of Retuning Your Firm. Uh, 40, it's a very large number. We're wondering what sort of ruby wedding present might be coming our way today, but that's another story. So what are the, today's themes, apart from rubies? Uh, change, and how do people go about change? With, with a somewhat slight focus on technology, but not exclusively, and I'm delighted that uh, James Falkenbridge from Lancaster Management University Lanky University Management School, let's get that right, is with us today. And he's been one of the professors on the project that we've been working on for the last couple of years, which is very exciting. Uh, Kim Tasso, many of you will know Kim. She's coming along to talk about soft skills. And then we have Luke Bardin, who is talking about partnering. So um, that's all very exciting. So what comes next? Well, let's just move on to who's on today's panel. As I mentioned, Kim. She's the founder and principal consultant of Red Star Kim Limited, and she's been about 20 years, I think, worked for hundreds of professional firms, really is a really, really great consultant, really worthwhile, does a lot of training for us as well. Professor James Falkenbridge, the assistant dean, um, recently promoted, congratulations, James, at the University of Lancaster Management School, and his focus has been professional services, as he'll explain later. Uh, Luke Bardin, who is the Chair of Strategic Partnering, who was formerly the Chief Marketing Officer of BP and then ran their Strategic Plan Partnering Unit, um, written a book on the topic, so again, very interesting guy. Francesca Lagerberg, who I think probably needs no introduction to most of you, but uh, she is the Global Leader Network Capabilities, Grant Thornton International, and has been on this call for 39 of the 40 um, sessions, episodes to date, which I think deserves at least a gold medal and uh, a long service award, but hey, she's on next week as well. So it's not, it's an ongoing, it's a journey, I think is the best way to put it. And of course yours truly, Richard Chaplin, the founder and chief executive of the Managing Partners Forum. So um, that's today's panel and in the order of appearance. So what are we gonna be talking about today? Well, let's just start by reminding ourselves of what are some seven strategies for retuning your firm. And these are ones that we, we talk about every week, but I really do think they set the scene and they really do help understand what are some of the key options and things you might not want to do as well. So firstly, you've got to think big. Uh, as Lewis Carroll said, you've got to believe six impossible things before breakfast. You've also got to think small. You've got to think about the angles that resonate with your key audiences. And that's kind of very critical because if you're not seen as relevant to your audience, particularly where, for example, clients haven't always been well-placed to maybe instruct you, but just really wanted to hear from you. So think small, think about the things that are going to really resonate. And those audience includes your own people. It's not just your clients. Remember that you are the power of your relationships, but that that's not a question of having a great address book. It's about reciprocity. It's about favors. It's about being looking for the win-win with people. Remember that actually, if you really want to engage, think about it as a campaign, not as a one-off, because that really does convert an audience into a community. And I like to think of the people who are on today's show as being a community, because many of you, and I can see this, are coming week in, week out, and it's wonderful and really appreciate your contribution. Um, waking up your, wake up your Friday mornings, as they say. Um, you're going to have to drop convention. Um, does anybody really remember what pre-COVID felt like? We say we do, but memory tri plays tricks on us. We all know that memory in the mind kind of merges the past and the future. So wh wh where, where do we currently go for? So be open to new ideas and new services, but get there quickly. But by with that, I mean, don't just go there, but actually articulate your assumptions. And actually when you're rolling out anything, what you're in practice doing is market testing your assumptions. And I'm an accountant and I know perfectly well that if you change the assumptions, otherwise known as the accounting policies, you change the profit. And I think it's the same in an organization. But the key point is validity. In other words, if those assumptions prove invalid and most experiments fail in life, as any scientist will tell you, then you need to amend them and pivot in a new direction. The word pivot's quite common, I think. It comes from Lean Start. It's a really interesting, great philosophy uh, to a, think about way of approaching things. Be entrepreneurial, keep listening and innovating. As I always say, the key word in that sentence is listening. If you're not listening to people, whether it's your clients, whether it's your, uh, your people, or indeed your, your wider community, you are not being as effective as you could. And I'd like to thank Elena Kudsko of Globsec Bratislava for that particularly, that set of seven, slightly adapted, but I think that was really interesting. Thank you very much for that. So what's going on in the, in the forum? And I, I appreciate that you can't necessarily see this very clearly, just maybe the red ones, but we've got a really interesting session coming up on Tuesday. 
called Planning an Optimal Pro Property Strategy for a Post-Lockdown World. And that's the Finance and Operations Group that's organising that. And that has been a really very well received. Lots of people have signed up for that. It's on Tuesday. So if you're interested, that's one to think about. You'll find the details also on the forum website. And uh, the second area is um, Fast Track Innovation. And James will be talking a little bit more about that because that's the, uh, the campaign, the flagship conference, we're calling it, that's happening in um, a little over a month's time, 17th of March in the afternoon. Um, and we'll be talking a bit more about that in coming weeks. What else is happening? Well, we're only 14 days away now from making a submission for our annual awards. And believe me, if there's been a year in which the contribution of management and leadership to the business has been almost existential, this has to have been the year. Um, focus on demand side for the first time, gosh, how we feed the machine, rather than normally just focusing on the, how do we get the people to serve the work demand. Um, been a real roller coaster. And for those of you on the show will have seen some of the uh, really quite sort of what we'll look back with retrospect and think, my God, we really lived through that because the sort of zigzags are really quite extreme at times, but we are where we are. But anyway, here's your chance. Um, as you can see, Knowledge Partners Hub Business Review and the FT, so absolutely interesting and worth winning. So do think about that. And that's any professional firm can enter for that anywhere. It's not UK centric and remotely. So that's the awards. Um, if you haven't picked it up already, uh, we've got over a hundred experts who have been contributing to the show since March. And if you remember, Dashita and Claire came along last week and then we had Nick standing up and telling us about how you could do some tips for long learning uh, last uh, the week before that. So do look up to those. We had 870 hits, if that's the right word, or views of those of that series over the past month. So it's clearly hitting a chord. So that's great. So let's move on now. Um, talk about polls. Uh, as you know, every week we do a poll and uh, the poll this week. I'll tell you in a second, not quite yet, but first of all, why are we doing them? Well, the answer is because it's not just for you and me and for us, it's actually for government as much as anything else. And here is a quote that government sent us, and I know that they want it because if I don't send it to them when they expect, then they basically tell me so. And that to me is a definition of thought leadership. So please contribute when it comes to it. And it's not just the government, the House of Lords used one of our polls in a report on the future of EUK EU relationships. Um, it reads rather sad reading now. It was written back in October. Um, but anyway, we are where we are. But the more important point to me was that uh, actually this is the only poll, I think, in that report which wasn't sourced from government stats. So that in itself, I think, shows that the polls we're doing carry importance. And they only work if you guys complete them. So it's kind of an obvious question to say. So let's look back. What happened last week? We talked about inclusiveness. And we kind of compared it with, I think it was back June, it was kind of in the middle of the BLM movement when I was kind of did the last inclusiveness poll. And I really wanted to see, has anything changed? Well, the blue, as you can see, is from the last week and the red one was back in June, middle of June. So keep those colors in mind as we go through. I'll go through them fairly quickly, but basically not too many changes in terms of responsibility. Uh, now this one is slightly more interesting because I think what this tells me is that back in June, people were slightly more positive about their inclusiveness than possibly is now the case. So I think a little bit of um, uh, awareness as quite how much they need to do has crept in. And we'll explain why in a minute, because if you move on and you ask questions like how often is it discussed at management meetings? OK, not too many at never, but only sometimes, which is the ones on the left and but as a standing item, not really, no. And it really does need to be if it's going to move up. If you ask about the extent to which inclusive ideas that work are adopted, yeah, there is some positive movement there, I think. But if you go to the other extreme, to what are the ones that don't work, dropped, maybe because it's somebody's pet campaign or pet idea. Again, quite a few nevers still, which is uh, a bit depressing, I guess, there. Uh, we also looked at targets and we looked at, um, and again, I'm sorry, you probably can't read these, but they're all on the website. But to what extent are employees from BAME backgrounds? And, and what's rather sad about this is that none of these targets are really getting much about 50 percent. So in other words, half the firms aren't doing any of them. Um, or, and, and that to me was kind of weird because these are things that you really do need to track the CEO um, being from a BAME background. Well, that's a metric that's going to move really, really slowly because of the way that the um, pipeline works. So these are sort of kind of intermediate steps that you would come across like across the way. So, you know, to what extent people are actually being 
assessed for leadership courses, put on leadership courses, speaking up at meetings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's good. So what extent are awards given for achieving these formal targets? Well, again, that's kind of worrying because almost never. In other words, they're kind of aspirational, I suppose you could call them. And also sanctions, the same applies. To what extent are sanctions given for falling short of these formal targets? So to be honest, they're kind of aspirational. Nobody's really doing much about them. And as we all know, in professional services, if there's no bite, they probably won't actually then come to anything, which is okay. But, you know, and, it, and this is kind of the one that really worries me particularly one on the left, the never, to what extent are sanctions given for conduct by senior management or partners that is not inclusive? And the numbers are quite significant in never. And believe me, if people at the top are able to act with impunity, then there's zero way that inclusiveness will really take hold in your organization. It will be paying lip service. So um, sadly, that hasn't changed a whole lot. And maybe this one kind of gives an idea why, because actually, on the whole, firms aren't that influenced by the popular movements such as BLM or um, <clears throat> Me Too, et cetera. So um, I, all I really wanted to say there is, I think we've all got a certain amount of work to do, but it's it, thank you for contributing. I know it's with, these are anonymous polls and for some people it's a bit difficult to meant to say that they're doing these things, but that's the way it is. So th that was the feedback from last week anyway. So let's move on today. Uh, today we're gonna talk about property um, and Property these days is actually really top of the agenda at the moment on most professional firms. And I don't necessarily mean just the obvious question of how many square feet do we need next year post COVID or whatever we're gonna call that period. Um, it's also how we're we gonna configure it because one of the things we are finding is that people go back to the office back in July, for example, found that the atmosphere had completely changed and thought, mm, don't really like this, went back home again. Uh, partners may have rushed in to get back to their book lined rooms, but that was slightly different. But in the open plan, wasn't the same. So what, what sort of office is there? Um, we're going to look a bit more about cost and what sort of cost is involved. And hopefully you should have a sense as to what your firm is paying per square foot. If you don't, then, well, that's another story. But at senior level, that really is something that is going to, it's a big number in your P&L, believe me. What's the typical level of desk vacancies pre-COVID? Again, that's something that you may not be fully aware of, but it's quite I can tell you well I won't tell you but I do know what the sort of average is across the UK um, so I can see how we match against that um, to the extent to which people are going to be commuting pre-post <clears throat> how long they spend commuting <clears throat> because there's a whole issue here around uh, particularly with COP26 coming up as to how do we actually make sure that uh, people are not um, are saving as much carbon as possible and through not commuting uh, how are office related benefits shifting pre-post and appreciate this is all it might happen it's not nobody knows and what a and possibly in a way the most important question is the one we're picking up on tuesday how are you going to sustain corporate culture in a world of hybrid workplaces because if there's one thing that's very clear is that people coming together is part of the culture and so if people aren't coming together particularly those who are 100 percent remote uh, how are you actually going to sustain that okay so what's that telling us let's just see share the results so um Pre-COVID, you can obviously see these. Um, we've got, well, I mean, it's, it, there's a fairly clear message here. There's a very small number of people who are working um, in sort of remotely, 92% if you have a traditional leased office. And looking ahead, some movement, 81% <clears throat> uh, for the traditional leased. Um, and again, if you're not seeing it, you can scroll down on the page. And other, then there's a, a few co-working desks coming up. There's a few team rotation and everyone working remotely. Uh, no serviced offices, no sharing, so uh, that's fine. In terms of um, the sort of uh, what's the, it's a pretty much a full range of <clears throat> payment. Uh, there's a few people who are paying over 160 pounds. That's probably about 100 pounds rent and then 60% roughly uplift for uh, service charge and uh, government taxes. And some of you, and no one's below 40, obviously, because that was kind of, you were probably just working from home, but 40 to 60. And obviously, if people have their own freehold, I've asked them to add it in. So we've got comparability there. But the, the most popular one is in the 80 to 100 pounds jointly with the 40 to 60. So it's kind of a mix of people today. It's anonymous, as you know, and we don't look at sector size. Um, in terms of vacancies, the answer here was less than 20%. You might be interested to hear that apparently the UK average is 56%. 
uh, in terms of vacant desks. So as a sector, and Kim may have views on this, we appear to be uh, slightly better users of our desks. Now, I've been uh, way back when I was an accountant with KPMG, Pete Marwick as was, uh, we had six desks for about 40 people because they wanted you to be out at clients. So I can kind of relate to that. So uh, anyway, but the main one is less than 20%. And then 2030, nobody's really doing, one person's over 70, I guess. Um, in terms of the people who are commuting, uh, 95 to 100% of people were working full time in um, it going into an office or client premises pre-COVID. And now 54% were looking at three days a week. And that's a big shift. And that will have all sorts of implications. Uh, and 27% two days a week. Um, 12% uh, five days a week. Interesting. Well, we'll see that. Nobody elsewhere. In terms of how long people are typically commuting to get to the office, 45 to 60 minutes is the typical commute. We can kind of work out how much global uh, carbon is being used for that and how much we save. It's quite an interesting calculation. I'm not going to try and do it for you live. So would fail miserably. Um, in terms of the things that people are actually doing to uh, kind of office things, I mean, all of them are coming in. The one that comes in highest is relaxed dress code, 77%. Uh, and then you've got the wellness program in at 50%. You've got uh, health screening at 42 So uh, those are the pre-COVID, post-COVID, 92% um, relaxed dress code. Well, that kind of makes sense, I guess. I don't think there's any fundamental changes there. And then we come to the last one, which is how are you how you intend to sustain your culture? And this is really quite interesting. Uh, regular updates from the leadership team, 96 percent. Well, that probably won't be surprising. Converting the office, about half of you wanting to convert it into a social space. That's quite a big percentage. I don't think we would have seen that pre-COVID. Um, 60 percent external social events, 58 percent community involvement, volunteering, uh, online lounge, about a quarter of you. Organizing office staff morale, uh, morale team things, volunteering, half of you. Company sports teams coming in at 27%. Lunch and learns, that's quite popular. Setting up a buddy system and none of the above, thankfully, 0%. So everybody's going to be doing something. That's great. So I'll stop sharing now and uh, I will be looking forward to introducing my first guest for today. So welcome, please, Kim Tasso. So you'd like to do soft skills in five minutes. Yep. So here we go. Um, back in uh, 2007, I think a joint research study by Stanford Research Institute showed that something like 75% of performance and excellence was accounted for by soft skills mastery as opposed to technical skills mastery. Uh, more recently, in the 2019 book by Greg Orm called The Human Edge, which is a great book, he said how we protect our future careers from AI and machine learning is by maximizing the use of four particularly human things, uh, consciousness, creativity, uh, curiosity, and collaboration. Um, my book on essential soft skills for lawyers, um, which was published last July, uh, followed 18 months of research into the subject and interviews with lots of law firm leaders and learning and development professionals and psychologists. And some of the key findings from that was that uh, lawyers need a very wide range of soft skills in order to deliver great service, uh, grow their teams and lead their businesses. And many saw soft skills as a key way to build competitive advantage. Um, the COVID pandemic has added a lot of extra soft skills to the list as well in terms of digital presence, uh, virtual team management and virtual client management. Um, Past studies have shown that emotional intelligence accounts for something like 58 to 60% of performance across all areas and as a big predictor of workplace performance. And in law firms, emotional intelligence was confirmed to be a very key set of skills and attributes for lawyers. Um, but very few firms actually use tools to measure emotional intelligence or, in, or actually to develop those uh, emotional intelligences. And again, while most firms had detailed competency frameworks for technical uh, and technology skills, very few had the same structured approach to um, measuring and developing soft skills. Um, so I said many skills were identified, but particularly mentioned by just about every firm that I spoke to was resilience, communication, uh, commerciality. Interestingly, critical thinking, problem solving and collaboration as matters and clients become more complex and multidisciplinary 
um, coaching and there was a great number of firms that had invested quite heavily in developing coaching skills throughout their organization negotiation and conflict management and of course business development with the triad of marketing selling and relationship management when i talked to people at the time most learning and development professionals said they didn't think it was uh, easy or possible to develop soft skills in a digital medium so it'll be interesting to see what they think about that now um, shifting over to kind of the, the technology industry following um, the world economic forum research in 2018 a number of leading tech employers like Google and Amazon and Microsoft highlighted the importance of learnability, which is the curiosity and a thirst for knowledge as a key career potential piece. And it was interesting that in September 2020, when Microsoft launched its Digital Skills Week, um, it actually had a number of speakers talking about how critically important soft skills were. And they identified, this is from the tech industry, emotional intelligence, trust and we're seeing a huge amount of information at the moment about creating trust in a virtual environment critical thinking team working persuasion and communication so that was uh, the tech industry talking about soft skills so to wrap up because i know time is tight um, i just wanted to add a couple of comments and my observations i think during covid <clears throat> you know as a psychologist survival anxiety outweighed learning anxiety so lots of people learned and adapted much quicker than they would do under normal circumstances um, going forward in that post-covid world we need to going to be able to create a really high degree of psychological safety if we want people to continue to learn at that rate um, it was interesting to observe during covid that most firms placed because they had to a much higher degree of attention on engagement and consultation with staff um, i actually was one law firm that actually made sure every single member of staff was phoned every single day um, and leadership skills uh, which were part of that i think uh, and keeping in touch with everyone in the organization and I, let's hope those efforts remain post covid um, and the final piece i suppose is is post covid um, the leadership skill set, which of course are all soft skills, um, and getting people to keep with the rate of change when all of the uh, isolation and uncertainty is finished, uh, I think the key core skills of influence and persuasion are going to come to the fore, and particularly um, in the global environment. And there are tools to measure cultural quotients your ability to get on with people from different uh, cultures. So I think that's going to be an even more interesting soft skill. I'll stop. Thanks, Kim. And uh, it's interesting. I mean, you make the comment that leadership skills are only soft. And um, we could have a conversation about that, but uh, I, won't, I won't go there yet. I shall invite um, our second presenter, second guest today, which is James Falkenbridge, who is the, as I mentioned, a, the Assistant Dean at Lancashire University Management School and has been working with um, other business schools and you know, the forum on an interesting project which is coming up with its flagship, as I mentioned, about five weeks' time. So, James, come and tell us a little bit about, not about the technology, because I, I know that most managing partners really are interested in the technology, but the context in which the technology might be deployed. Over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you, Richard. And um, yeah, so as Richard said, for the last two years, we've been working on a project called the Next Generation Professional Service Firm Project. Um, and in that research, we have been thinking about technology, but, but not really from a technical perspective and not obsessing about what technology and algorithms or machine learning or whatever it might be can or cannot do. But rather, we've been thinking about professional service organizations and what it means for them as organizations, um, what they look like today, how they might look in the future. And of course, COVID has, has changed that conversation somewhat, but also actually, I think, provided an opportunity to pause and reflect and think about what we learned before COVID and how that becomes relevant today and as we move forward. So, so that's what I want to reflect on a little bit today, what we learned from, from our research, but also what it might mean for, for what um, organisations might want to be doing now as we think about whatever this post-COVID period is and, and whenever it is. So... Just to kind of a year ago, um, I, I, I was involved in one of Richard's events and, and we were not quite well. It was just not quite a year ago. We were thinking, what do we do now? Um, and I think many of the conversations about how do we work at home? How do we um, deal with the fact we're not in the office, of course, moved on and we're entering a different stage. And, and changes in organizations and, and new technology certainly played a role in that transition, obviously, Zoom. But, but some organizations, of course, had the advantage of, of having 
putting new technology in place that allowed them to respond to their clients' needs in, in different ways and had learned lessons from the, the kind of transition journey that they've been on as they've been started to bring new technology into the organization. Um, as I say, I think we've moved beyond that stage now, and really we're now at a moment where it's important to pause and, and reflect and think about what, what might the future look like. Uh, um, think about what role technology has in that, but really not over obsessed with it and, and instead ask the question about what are the challenges, what are the opportunities, and then maybe pause and think about how technology might be part of the response to those challenges and opportunities. And so, so what we've been doing in our research, and Richard mentions is um, an event coming up shortly where, where we're gonna kind of present some of the key findings um, from this. What we've done first and foremost is look at what organizations have been doing in terms of using technology, but to change their business model, professional practice, or, or the fundamental kind of raison d'etre of the organization. So really the question and the, and, and the conversation starts not with the technology, but with the question of what's your purpose as an organization? What do you offer your clients? What do your clients need? Um, and how do you deliver that? Um, so, so as part of our research, we've, we've focused in as much on the business model and, and the professional practices within organizations as we have the technology. And, and as part of our research, we've developed a series of case studies that have looked at how organizations have changed their, their business model, their client offering, um, and the professional practices that allow that offering to be delivered. Um, and, and that's a really important conversation to have before you even ask the question about what is the technology. Because unless we know the purpose, the, the reason, the change that needs to happen, um, you know, asking what technology can do is, is a little bit pointless. And really, as we move into this kind of post-COVID area, it certainly now is the time where these questions need to be asked. And where do we anticipate being in five years time in terms of what we offer our clients and how we offer it? Um, equally important though, and this connects to, to some of the things that Kim was talking about, it's also about how you actually make this happen. It's about how you actually implement this and the approaches that you need to take to, to kind of go on that journey once you've done the analysis and worked out what your purpose, what you, your objectives are. Because if, if, we, if there's one thing we know about professional service firms is that if you don't bring your people with you, then nothing's going to happen. Um, and, and what we've done in the research is look at a series of kind of cross-cutting questions that you could ask about any kind of future scenario for organizations. Um, what, what does your partnership look like in the future? Um, what does buy-in from your professionals look like and how do you achieve it? Um, trying to avoid the question about the technology and more thinking about the organization and how it will need to change and evolve in line with new client offerings, but also the way technology facilitates that. And so by thinking about how partnerships change as you need experts who are able to use technology and provide data-led services, you, you ask questions about the fundamental kind of architecture of the professional service organization. And these are not new questions in many ways. We could have stood here 10 years ago and asked the question, what's the future of your partnership? But there's new dimensions to this that start to emerge as you begin to rethink the business model. You begin to rethink the kind of professionals that you might anticipate having in your organization in the next five to 10 years. And so that question about what's the purpose, but also how do you implement and what approaches do you need to achieve the change is, is really crucial. Otherwise, it just becomes another kind of strategic plan that, that sits on a shelf um, and doesn't get delivered. So to conclude, um, where we've ended up with our research is, is the, we're using an analogy of a journey um, and that all firms need to go on a journey as part of this process that begins by thinking, yes, about technology, but more importantly, about their, their organization, their business model um, and the way their organization operates. And then through this journey, and there are various detours that can be taken along the way, and COVID has certainly been a detour with new scenery that many of us didn't expect. Um, but as part of that, that journey and those detours, there are stages that allow incremental change, sometimes radical change in the organization, that ultimately kind of develops a new future-orientated model um, that has technology in it, but more fundamentally has, has a real recognition about what the, the form of the professional service firm should be in the future. So I'll stop there. And as I say, um, Richard, I'm sure we'll do a plug for, for the event at some point uh, where we'll talk more all about this. But, but hopefully that's some useful input. Yeah, thank you very much, James. That's really uh, interesting. And it's been fascinating from my perspective to work with a group of switch, uh, really sort of um, interesting 
academics, if I can use that term without trying to cause offence. I mean, uh, professional firms typically haven't been very engaged and academics typically haven't actually seen a huge amount of focus into our sector. James is, is, is an exception and, and, and a very honourable exception, but a lot of them really think that uh, manufacturing, which is 10% of the economy, as opposed to services, professional services, which is a bigger number. Um, but anyway, things may change and we think that this study will at least shed a light and maybe people will then want to understand a bit more about how we as a sector tick. Uh, I'd now like to pass on to uh, our third guest for today, Luke Bardin. Uh, Luke is an expert in strategic partnering and I think one of the lessons that I'm taking away from the COVID is that everybody can be a silo if they want to but actually working with others is a far more effective approach particularly when you can't just send somebody on a plane somewhere else if you, if you have a client that has a, a need in a particular country, you've really got to get to know local people in that country, local suppliers, if you like, other firms in order to work with them. So the whole notion of strategic partnering, I think it's going to become very, very important in this post-COVID world. Over to you, Luke. Uh, good morning, Richard and, and colleagues, and thank you for this uh, incredibly uh, inspiring introduction. Uh, and also thank you uh, to Kim for mentioning collaboration and to James for mentioning partnership so uh, often. I think they set the scene. Uh, for what I'm uh, trying to going to reflect upon. Uh, it's a great opportunity to talk about my life's passion, which is, as you just said, uh, Richard strategic partnerships. And of course, one of the outcomes, which is growth in every meaning of the world. Um, what I uh, probably do is talk about uh, around four points. The first one will be taking inspiration for the manager uh, managing partners forum, then uh, defining a bit strategic partnerships, uh, following this, uh, I'll bore you with what my COVID years has been and finally invite you in the magic of successful partnership, if that's okay. So starting with the Managing Partners Forum and specifically uh, of its last year's COVID awards. Uh, last year, the winner of the category I was privileged to be a judge of was the combination of a business management consultancy in partnership with one of our greatest universities. What they had done over time was to develop a method to align learning and development with board strategies. That alignment would impact the company's strategic planning, how to drive change, better customer centricity, and so on. In a sense, it's what about, it was about moving the firm professionals from a single knowledge focused on law to multi-skills, enabling to diversify offers to their clients. What the partner did was to combine and apply academic, practitioner, and advisory knowledge. Each party was bringing a unique capability and managed to, in doing so, over time, announce each other's success. A brilliant award, which I think the four of us voted un uh, unanimously as the first one among a very, very, um, a very high level um, uh, set of competitors. Okay, so that's a taking inspi inspiration from, um, uh, from a Managing Partners Forum. But of, but of course, there are thousands, hundreds of thousands, if even new strategic partnerships created every year. It's exactly your point, Richard, isn't it? But what are they? Well, I suppose if we want to define strategic partnerships, I would do it in the following way. They are a voluntary engagement of organizations to bring assets to other parties that these parties don't have, and over time, deliver strategically important business objective that none of the parties could have achieved on their own and by traditional means such as purchasing. Of course, this is a pretty different meaning to partnerships as a form of association, as we know it in our profession, and bear with that definition if that's okay. If we accept that definition of strategic partnering, let me talk briefly of my COVID year through four partnering vignettes, and don't go to sleep, please, uh, if, that's, uh, if I hope uh, that's uh, the better case. The first one is, been very, we've been very privileged to contribute to the massive national PP and ventilators challenge. You will remember these times when we didn't have these equipments available for uh, caring people. In fact, here, the, partner, the partnership practice was about getting the private sector to punch above their weight and take decisions and do things that they wouldn't probably not have taken or done, at least in the same way normal times. For example, to create onshore manufacturing capacity. The enabler on the other side of a partnership was a somewhat unusual support and sometimes different contracting mechanism from government. The partnership came from the approach and the ways of working adopted by the, by the parties throughout this crisis resolution. My second vignette now, a couple of weeks ago, we merged two massive hospitals, one of which I, I am a non-executive director. These are Guys and St. Thomas's, 
on one side of the river, and the Royal Brompton and Airfield NHS Foundation Trust on the other side of the river. The only way that this amazing story could be achieved was to develop over the last two years a deeply partnering approach between the institutions and their involved people. With much more of this to come, the outcome will be a world-scale integrated care and research organization for cardiovascular and respiratory disease. My third anecdote relies on that during COVID and probably in an invisible way, I hope in an invisible way actually, nuclear submarines and defense surface ships need to continue playing their role to protect the country, notably by ensuring, uh, uh, ensuring deterrence. And this has to happen irrespective of potential major staff issues or whatever might arise from a COVID context. Only infinitely cooperative and integrated ways of working between the multiple involved parties can provide the nation with that assurance. You'll be relieved that I'm getting into my fourth and final example. And that relates onto building a nuclear plant. As you can imagine, many organizations participate to their construction and have to work in a deeply continuing cooperative manner over years and years. So their respective works combine the best way possible and of course, provide value for money. If you think about Inclay Point C and Size Well C, this is a challenge that only partnerships can truly handle. I'm sorry that these examples might look slightly different to the world of professional services companies, except that it is a professional service company that provides the expertise to set up and nurture this relationship and combine these uh, joint endeavors to make them work and, uh, uh, work and, and perform jointly. Now to my final point on the magic of partnerships and how to, it applies to our professions. If you need finances, access to new markets, access to new knowledge, capabilities, cap capacities which you don't have, then think strategic partnerships. My main purpose in life is that usually they don't work to plan except they have, if they are well practiced. This requires a rigorous methodology and a similar rigor than when working a piece of law or a piece of accounting or whatever the science that you're practicing. It is in fact, as people talk about sometimes, the science of partnerships. My final encouragement will therefore be to use and abuse of the partnership practice and be fine while you're doing this to invest in what it takes to develop the muscles to succeed with them. Spend my life doing so, what books, articles can therefore assert with some confidence the transformational value and the magic of the practice. So. Good luck, good luck with your private partnerships, and thank you very much. Thank, <clears throat> thanks, Luke. That's really amazing. And if you haven't, and probably haven't, but Luke has written, I think, a fantastic book, which explores the science of partnering in a lot more depth. So, Francesca, uh, we've had our three guests. Um, what are your thoughts for today? Oh, my goodness. What a great spread today. That, that was that was absolutely fascinating. Um Maybe, maybe a bit in, a bit in reverse order, actually. Uh, uh, Luke, that's wonderfully good to, to, to help challenge us around how you can take other, other areas that have a huge link to professional service firms and learn from them. Maybe just on the partnering side of it, I, I, I've noticed how many professional services firms in our, in our smaller accounting sphere have, have decided that actually strategic partnerships are such a successful way for them to link their clients with other organizations who are going to be a huge help to them and actually being the connector as opposed to necessarily wanting to develop the service themselves. And I think there's a, a real win there about being a good on your core things, but having great links with like-minded organizations that you can pass with trust to your clients and you're an intermediary uh, not necessarily taking any money for that. You're just giving your clients a great ecosystem and, and really uh, maybe taking that a step further into full-blooded strategic partnerships where you are really beginning to grow your practice in a very different way without having to go out and get the people and the infrastructure to deliver something that somebody else already does brilliantly. I, th I think there's a lot for us to learn there. And, and I love the, the research that you're doing, James. There's some very fascinating elements of that. And, and perhaps the, one, the, the first point she made, which I think is, is one that is such a powerful one, is that technology is an enabler. It's not the answer if you don't know what you're trying to do. So uh, the classic garbage in, garbage out moment that we've all experienced where you've got some amazing tech and you use 5% of it because you haven't quite worked out what it was that you really wanted the tech to do. And I think people are so much smarter these days around how they use and think about technology and marrying that 
with humanity, which I think takes you back to Kim. Um, some great insight there. And, and I, I noticed that uh, we always talk about soft skills, don't we? And I suspect that's where Richard might have been leading us. The, one of the hardest thing in the world is soft skills, isn't it? You, you know, to be really emotionally intelligent, to really have empathy, to really resonate with what your clients truly want as opposed to what you want to sell them. Um, it's a massively important part and skill in professional services firms and often casually brushed over. And yet it really is one of the most powerful pieces. And perhaps I'll link it to the question from Mike in the, in the Q&A. And thank you, Mike, for joining us week after week. You are a superstar um, and, and so is always so engaged. Um, he, uh, Mike has asked the question, Richard, about will coaching still have the same resonance in a post-COVID world? How can you evolve that? And I'm sure Kim will have thoughts on this, but perhaps I could just share one final thought around that. Um, Grant Thornton was really was, was privileged to be awarded a coaching award by the EMCC, it's the European Coaching Group, uh, in the last week. And that the people who've been running that program have embedded coaching uh, within the network and they've taken it into lots of different cultures and lots of different parts of our network. But the, the real standout, of course, is what people do with coaching, because coaching is obviously hugely valuable for you personally. But having a coaching mentality in how your people work and how your culture operates in how you deal with clients is just, I think it's just one of the most powerful tools. And you don't have to be an expert to get great value from learning how to use coaching. Coaching thinking, you know, don't just keep giving answers, which is what experts tend to do. Um, really thinking about how you can help clients and help your own people develop. Um, and I'm sure Kim will have great insight around that piece because uh, for me, a good professional service firm needs a coaching mentality as part of its underpinning. Uh, Kim, um, as you probably expect, um, what, what's your thoughts on the, the point that um, Michael has raised, re-coaching and the future of coaching? And uh, I, I think the point that Francesca made around there's no such thing as hard as soft skills. Maybe you should come up with a new term for it because it kind of doesn't give it justice. Yeah, I did a, a whole video with a worry monster, actually, about what should they be called rather than soft skills. So have a look at that if you want some a laugh with your kids because it's got the worry monster in it and a robot. Um on um, coaching, I actually think, I agree with uh, Francesca, it's kind of part of your culture that you get people to think things through for themselves uh, rather than tell people what to do. That has to be the essence of growing a, a professional practice and, and smart people. And of course, you know, the whole thing around confidence and the whole coaching piece, whether at a leadership level or a team level or in terms of helping clients with their problems and co-creating solutions with clients, it is the fundamental coaching uh, skills. And I don't think really in the remote environment, um, the fundamentals of that change. But of course, as I, as I mentioned, you know, the, the coaching is only successful when there's a really strong relationship between who's doing the coaching and who's receiving the coaching, whether that's peers or seniors or juniors. So I think, you know, understanding how you create that uh, trust, particularly for new relationships that didn't exist before the virtual world. So creating that trust building those relationships in a virtual environment where there wasn't one before. And I think the other thing that's a, a bit of a worry at the moment and, and, and concerns me and some of the firms I'm working with is this kind of distance bias. If there are people that are constantly popping up on your screen and speaking up in meetings, you tend to pay them more attention than those who are perhaps a bit quieter for confidence reasons or cultural reasons or whatever else. And we tend to ignore those. So I think the, the coaching piece has to look more at uh, adapting to how different people have moved into the virtual environment and how they will um, be brought into the center even though they're effectively they're remotely psychologically absolutely so that's all i wanted to really say on 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 the on the coaching piece richard i think oh that's very kind um james just kind of picking up leadership for a minute because obviously that's something that kim's mentioned and has come up in the various contexts i mean to what extent do you think this study that you've been working on uh has lessons for leadership um in the professional firms Without doubt. And, and as I said when I was speaking, you know, forget the technology, think about the organization and, and to pick up on um, one of Kim's kind of points about allowing people to, to discover it for themselves rather than um, trying to discover it for them and then inform them. I mean, one of the key lessons of, of, of our study is, is about how you engage with your professionals about these kinds of changes um, and the kinds of narratives that you use and how you allow it, them to discover it for themselves in Kim's terms, rather than imposing it on them and telling them about why they 
should and have to do this. Um, so we, we all know um, the, the, the kind of hype that goes with, you know, the AI revolution, everyone will lose their jobs, um, all of these kinds of narratives, which are the first kind of things that people think of when when a new piece of technology arrives. Um, and and in, in some ways, it's very easy to, to kind of kind of re replicate that narrative in how how you might try and sell it to, to people within the organization but but what we discovered was it was very much more about actually how professionals discovered these changes for themselves and, and and connected it to their values and what they what's important to them as a professional and in many ways many of the changes allowed them to do what they really wanted to do for their clients better than they ever imagined they could do um, but they had to work in a different way to do it but actually the, the motivation was there for them once the kind of leaders of the organization gave them that space and that opportunity to discover it in that way and i mean I, i'm sure for everybody on this call this none of this anecdote won't be a surprise but we did look at one organization that adopted um, a new piece of technology for a very good reason it was connected to a very clear purpose and, and, and what what it was going to deliver for the client and the organization but but the modus operandi was to say everybody's going to adopt this unless you can give us a very good reason not to um, you can imagine how many partners found reasons not to um, I think it was all bar about three um, because there, there was reasons in every case while their client or their team it wasn't right for them because they hadn't discovered what it could actually do they were just told this was the future and what we needed to do so so the right kind of leadership is crucial and and, and say everybody that knows anything about professional service firms recognizes this but but it is easy at times to forget that particularly when you, you encounter kind of some of the disruptive kind of changes that technology can bring and and think that well this has to sort of be a much more top-down big bang kind of revolution and and that may work on a few occasions, but I think in, in most cases, it's about that, that kind of more intelligent leadership that, that really fits with that model of um, kind of the autonomous professional um, and recognizing that that, that, that would, has not gone away and remains um, and work, but working with that as, as something that is, a, you know, has great potential rather than seeing it as a kind of barrier and a problem. Yeah, there's, there's, a, one, <clears throat> there's a wonderful expression called strategic non-compliance, which basically means that you are... Uh, uh, absolutely in favour of what's going on, but unfortunately, um, your feet are stuck in concrete, so you can't actually do anything about it. Uh, Luke, um, just picking up strategic partnering for a minute, and I'm very interested about, I won't say where you start, but I mean, is this a top-down exercise? We've kind of just heard that that doesn't always work, or is it a bottom-up? Do you encourage a small group within the organisation to reach out to people that they perhaps work with already, but make it more structured? Well, if somebody was saying, well, I like strategic partnering, but where do I start? What would be your answer? Um, thanks. Well, I, in fact, it, it, in fact, I, I'll be cheeky uh, and build on what we just heard, which is why don't we move the world leadership into something which would be called uh, partnering leadership um, and, 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 and just sort of merge the two worlds, if that's okay. Because in fact, um, uh, if you think about top-down, bottom-up, the only part that is absolutely top-down, if you want to succeed with partnering, partnering leadership or whatever, is the methodology. Uh, it is just to say that's the recipe, that's the way of, of sort of uh, making, the, making the cooking. But the cooking is entirely yours. And in fact, the outcome of good partnering, good partnering in leadership is probably to, um, uh, to, to steal words from Kim and, um, uh, and James. They're probably about co-creation. They're building trust, which is sticky. Uh, it is about empowerment. It is about people to find out and discover by themselves. It's all about this. It's exactly the inverse of the top-down traditional leadership, as you might uh, you might have expected. So, uh, uh, so I'm not answering your question. I'm going to do this in uh, 30 seconds. Um, but I, I did absolutely wanted to pick and steal from what Kim and James were saying, uh, just to add uh, and build on that. But to your point, where do you start? Um, I suppose the uh, the first thing that you probably do is to look at, a, uh, look at the methodology. So spend a bit of time, invest a bit of time, look at the methodology in order to do it, um, you know, and, and guide people and invite people more than guided people into, into that magic. And then you let people go, just following that methodology. But within that methodology, which is the framework, just operate in the way they decide. They'll be much more clever than anybody else to do what they've got to do. That, that's fascinating. And it's actually curious that, that is also, in a way, the way that we have been approaching the project, which we, I think, journey, James mentioned is a journey. In other words, that we are looking to, to give people, this is a journey that we have found is, helps get you from A to B. And it's a very, the very key adage in management, it is you either give somebody an outcome 
or you give them a process, don't try and give them both. Uh, if you give them the outcome, then they've got to work out how to get there. If you give them the process, then um, that's fine, but you've got to be absolutely clear what the outcome is. So um, all I really wanted to say there is, I'd love to hear what Francesca has to say. We're into our last few minutes. It's been a, a really quite, moved quite fast today. I think it's been some really interesting topics I and mean, nuclear submarines don't normally come in, that's for sure. But, uh, <laughs> I think that must be a first, hasn't it? For, for 40 episodes in, we've got our first nuclear submarine. But yeah, there, there, there is a lot to take away from there. And, and doesn't it just show you, if you perhaps pull all those strands together, is how professional service firms continue to evolve, but also the acceleration of the change here, because I think every single thing we've talked about today is about how we take our existing practices, we learn from what we've just seen, we take them forward into the next, the next, and five years feels like a lifetime away, doesn't it? So I, I'm kind of thinking that a year, a year in professional services feels like quite a long time at the moment. So what we can take forward with that and, and how we can just learn from other organisations, not to be too narrow focused, not be funnel visioned and what we've always done. Look at how other organisations are really utilising the opportunities. And that's really powerful. Um, perhaps the virtual world has opened our minds in, in some ways, might have closed our ability to go outdoors, but opened our minds. Yeah, I think, unfortunately, that's probably now coming up to the time. So I'd just like to uh, say that uh, we've certainly been, uh, a re I think, a really fascinating show today. And I, and I wanted to thank um, Kim for talking about soft skills, or maybe we should be calling them hard skills, but I'm really going to look forward to her video. Uh, I'd like to thank James for reminding us that tech is an enabler and that at the end of the day, leadership is critical. And I'd like Luke for his final thought around, well, maybe partnering in leadership are actually the same word, we're just using them in a different context. Now, that's not the same as servant leadership. I think you do need to set a methodology, you need a journey, you need a way of getting from A to B that everybody can follow or adapt to suit them. But what I find curious about our sector is that uh, everybody wants to be different, but at the same time, recognize that 95% of what they do is the same as everybody else, but they want to feel they have the opportunity to be different at the beginning, even if they end up in the same place. And that is, curiously, one of the biggest challenges in marketing professional services firms, because the differentiation is, well, where do you start? Anyway, marketing people in future sessions will talk all about that. So I'd like to thank our three panellists. Uh, next week, um, oh, quickly just looking at the slide, yes, all the uh, full videos are there. And as I mentioned earlier, the individual slots will be up there early next week on YouTube and 800, 900 views so far on that one. Next week, we've got um, three different people coming in. We've got Seamus Ray who is Engine B, if you're familiar with that, which is all about standard data because you can't really uh, have access to a client data if it's all been structured in a different way. Much easier to uh, have one common set of data standards. Uh, we got Nicholas Sawford, who is a serial non-exec director, talking about what's the role of the non-exec non director being in the COVID world? Uh, how do they add value? Where do they put their efforts? And then we've got Ian Beveridge, who runs a really interesting uh, online event company, which actually could take you everywhere from putting on your headset and going into a virtual world to just a bit like today, another Zoom call and everything in between. So it'd be, again, I think another interesting set of people. I'm really going to look forward to uh, being with you then. And all I'd really like to say as usual is um, to uh, remind you that, uh, as I said, today was the 40th episode, which is quite scary. Uh, I hope you found it valuable. And please encourage your peers to join us for future episodes and uh, back next Friday. So look forward to it. Bye for now.